Hello everyone and welcome back to another Kerbal Space Program video in which we're going to be sending another mission to Laith in my ongoing series, Life on Laith. This will be the uh, penultimate addition to the overall infrastructure on the moon. The plan, init the initial plan for all the bases I had was to have an orbital base, which we've now done, an ocean base, which we've now done, and of course the land base base <laughs> as well which of course we've now done as well but while we have all like the main structures in place we now need a means of getting kerbals to and from each base so i thought about a few ways of doing this the first way is having some sort of universal craft that can get into lathe orbit and can land on the ocean and can land on the land so it effectively links all three bases together as one universal solution however i thought we could probably get a better result using this craft here so well using two crafts i should say so the first is just a terrestrial seaplane, so once it lands on Laith, it can't escape Laith again, at least without the, without additional boosters getting being added to it. Um, it essentially fulfills the role of a surface base, but it obviously has wings and engines so it can fly, so we can, lots, we can investigate lots of different biomes and or oceans, because this thing can land on both land and sea. And as you can see, it has a mining rig and drill and ore tank, so it can refuel itself, so it effectively can charter the entirety of Laith all on its own, if we so desired. It's not as convenient for the Kerbals um, as it would be for, say, living on a surface base, just because a little bit less, it's a little bit, uh, I don't know, more precarious being on a constantly moving base, and there's less room to live and stuff like that. So it's not as practical uh, for the Kerbals on board, but of course, you know, generally in KSP, that doesn't really matter too much to us, but I do like to, uh, you know, show some benevolence <laughs> as the leader of these people, um, or creatures, I should probably maybe a more accurate <laughs> noun to describe them. But as you can see, the general shape of this craft is coming together all nicely. So as you can see, we have every single type of type of science experiment. I did a great job of pronouncing that sentence. Uh, we have available to us. We have the lab as well, just for style points, I suppose. And uh, of course, we have the... Uh, the landing legs as well but obviously the most in, probably the most notable or one of the most notable things of this craft is the box wing design which is a design i i went i went through a bit of a phase of doing a lot of box wings when i was doing my minmus base hotel and casino series and then i didn't do many since i think the idea really um if you'll pardon the pun took off <laughs> on the subreddit a lot of people built box wings and then everyone stopped <laughs> so i'm reviving at least my tendency to build box wings especially i always found that box wing aircraft have made really good seaplanes i guess because it means a lot of the lifting surface is above the waterline i don't know if this makes much difference practically speaking in terms of ksp's physics engine but it seems to work quite well so i went with it um it's also important with seaplanes to have a lots of um lifting surfaces close to the front so you can nose up out of the water this thing obviously has a very, very uh, high amount of dry mass. So that's why we've got the really powerful Panther engines. They're not actually my first choice of engine. My first choice of engine would have been the smaller engines, like the not the not the small, small jet engines, but the one one step below the Panther. And I can't remember what they're called. I feel like they're not the Juno because the Junos are the really tiny ones, are they? The Wheezy, possibly? I'm not sure. Anyway, the subsonic jet engines would have been my uh, first choice just because they're far more efficient. And this thing does not really need to have the ability to go over Mach 1 because it's an exploration and chartering craft. And aerodynamically speaking, it doesn't really have the same profile as a supersonic aircraft. But, you know, it needs high thrust to get out of the water. So I had to go with the Panthers just to enable it to do aquatic takeoffs. Um, we'll have to switch them to their... Uh, wet mode to uh, you know use the afterburners to get enough thrust to get out of the uh, ocean but other than that they will provide the thrust we need to fulfill this thing's role as an ocean lander anyway hello everyone who's just joining us after skipping the time lapse here is a nice cinematic cinematic shot of the rocket taking off quite a top heavy rocket i did debate not having the fairing on there but it looked a little bit dumb so i just went with the fairing it looks a bit it looks a little bit better, and that goes, does say something about how it looked without the fairing, because this fairing does look a bit um, ridiculous. <laughs> so I'll play back the footage at varying speeds, depending on how interesting what's going on is, and at the moment it's just a fairly standard gravity turn, so I'll uh, play the footage back relatively quickly. Um, I'll say it again, for those that don't really know, I generally aim to be pointing at 45 degrees by the time I hit 10 kilometers. Um, this one I have to go with a very sort of gentle gravity turn really those vector engines at the base are there in place of fins as you can see this thing is very top heavy so it's very flip happy if left kind of if, if flown too uh, liberally <laughs> so you could do one or two things either you can have some fins at the bottom which will help control it there or you can use the vector engines which have an enormous amount of gimbal range and can you know 
uh, counteract any kind of off balances that may occur during the flight. I didn't go with the fins just because I prefer having the clean finless look and also because of the fact that we had two gigantic side boosters. They were the mammoth engine so formerly those fuel tanks were the biggest in the game before the DLC came out which also gives you a nice scale of how big the Saturn V parts are now. Um, they were so big that when, when they're separated there's a good chance they would have hit into the side of the fins so I thought it'd be far, far safer from everyone's point of view to uh, be using the vectors especially since this is a crewed flight not a drone flight which is what a lot of the uh, what are the lot of the missions in this series have been so far uh, so yeah that's that was the reasoning behind this vessel's design but I guess we can say goodbye to that lower stage in just a second because we are now flame out we can wait for to get through the thicker parts of the uh, atmosphere just so when the heat dies down so we can deploy the fairings without having to worry about exposing the craft to uh, high levels of heat although I guess that's a I'm just thinking out loud now that's probably a moot point because when we get to lathe we will be doing some aero breaks anyway so I guess this thing was built <laughs> to withstand re-entry heat but I guess you know if we can minimize the amount of thermal stress on this thing whenever we can we probably should all points aside we are in space now so just i like to just do a quick f3 to make sure that nothing was destroyed on fairing deployment and there's a little shot of the craft deploying its solar panels and of course its communications antenna the solar panels are not really necessary they're just there to serve as a backup really because this thing does have four rtgs if memory serves me correctly just because on dual solar panels are not very efficient anyway and on lathe obviously if it's at night <laughs> solar panels aren't very useful there and in flight solar panels won't be very useful either because they'll be destroyed by aerodynamic forces it's good to have as a lot of electricity available to you when you have mining rigs because the uh, converge convertitron uses a lot of electricity so i kind of just used the solar panels to act as a sort of buffer for the rtgs and of course we have a lot of battery power as well how much is that uh, i can't really read it from here but it's over 2000 Maybe it's more than that. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, we're going to continue our um, expedition in not using f uh, nuclear engines for the transfer stage to Lathe just because I kind of like, I've kind of got used to uh, having nice, relaxing, fun missions, not having to worry about multiple burns at periapsis or anything like that, just doing every single burn in one big go and very, very small burns as well using the Rhino engine. When I finish this series and I end up going back to more efficient and quote unquote sensible and practical missions we may go back to the nuclear engines or at least something a bit more efficient for a vacuum like the poodle or the wolfhound engine but for now i am enjoying <laughs> the relaxing pace of using the rhino engine i guess it means the uh the video's pace is never too diminished for you guys at home so maybe you guys like seeing the rhino get used more as well i feel like as an engine i don't use the rhino very much so it's nice to give it some some sh to showcase it a bit there are engines in this game that i think i've actually never ever used i've know a lot of the making history engines i've never used the ones i have used are the f1 engines i don't know what they're called in this game it's like the uh e1 or engine is like one letter next to f in the alphabet or something basically the saturn 5 engine i've used that and i've also used the wolfhound engine because it is ludicrously overpowered um bradley wistons did the best job of showcasing this by making an unrefueled tylo ssto which was impossible for the wolfhounds but you know not to diminish that i have no i can't imagine myself ever having the patience for such an achievement but there you go there's an example of how powerful the wolfhounds really are um but yeah those are the things. Those are the only two. I'm trying to think. I think I might have used a, one of the Russian engines in my LAN Aerospace series just because one of those episodes I made right after the DLC came out. So I felt obliged to try and cram as many making history parts into the craft. But other than that, I don't think I... Like, I've not used the Cheetah or any of the vacuum engines or anything. So maybe maybe I should give some priority to those. Maybe in later episodes on Life and Lathe, we can explore some of the potential uses for the making history DLC. But I guess it's not really that new, is it, anymore? So probably people, people probably aren't interested is it something that a lot of people own as well like for me it was it was a no-brainer buying the dlc because obviously i you know make a somewhat semi-living out of this game so it would make sense for me to get the most up-to-date version of it but is that something that most people have because as a player i don't know if i would have really bought it because the main selling point of the dlc is the mission builder but i was never really that interested in that i was interested in the parts and the parts you could get equivalents in sort of mod packs so I, i'm curious do you guys like have making history um i've never actually considered this but yeah i wonder how many people because i've always considered the making history part stock which is why i always use them but if it's not something that people have 
or not many people have, then I'll try and stay away from making history parts whenever possible. Like, uh, I do like the Saturn V fuel tank, but I can just go back to the regular fuel tank. I did do okay before the DLC came out. So yeah, let me know, let me know. Actually, I didn't plan on asking this, but now I am actually kind of curious after that sort of out loud thought process. Anyway, kind of a long tangent about the Making History DLC, but here we are at Lathe. We're doing our initial capture burn. Well, there we go, we've said it. We're doing our initial capture using an engine burn, but then we'll do some subsequent aero breaks because we don't have enough fuel yet to get ourselves into a completely circular low Lathe orbit. And then we'll do the final bit of deceleration using the engine once again. So you can see I've got that kind of truss sort of structure using those external fuel tanks there. Um, as opposed to internal fuel tanks, I guess, um, just to provide a little bit of kind of structural support for the craft, especially whilst we're taking the brunt of our initial aero brakes. And also because it looked cool, you know, otherwise the rocket would have been very, very long and tall if I just built like regular fuel tanks on the back of this plane. But if I made the narrow ones that extend along the body of it towards the front, it distributes the fuel a little bit more evenly across the structure and doesn't result in a really, really long spacecraft, which is makes things a little bit more difficult when it comes to launching it off Kerbin. And I guess controlling it through aero brakes as well. So there's some little shots there. I'm playing the footage back relatively quickly now. We just did a few aero brakes. For the most part, I tried to remain sort of pointing retro, uh, pointing prograde, sorry, for most of the aero brake, just to make it a little bit more realistic. Then as, the, uh, as we leave the atmosphere, we can start doing some more aggressive rolls, try and create as much air resistance as possible and force our apoapsis down even further. So we've nearly completed the first part of this mission. I'll talk briefly about the second part before we get right into it. As you can see, we've got two Kerbals aboard this thing right now. They're going to form the crew for the surface base. Now the surface base, actually I'm talking about the land base, not the ocean base that is. Now the actual land base has far more crew cabins and general overall capacity than the ocean base. The reason for this is that the ocean base was only ever meant to have two Kerbals on board and then the land base would have four Kerbals on board because, you know, the bigger base can carry the bigger capacity while the smaller base can get a little bit cramped if there's too many Kerbals on board. I mean both are pretty spacious but you know if we can it would probably make more sense to put less Kerbals on the smaller one. However for those that watched the last Life on Lathe you'll know that the ocean base currently has four Kerbals on board and that gives us the perfect opportunity to test this thing's kind of main function and that is to serve as a way of connecting the ocean base uh, to the land base. So we can begin our deorbit burn now. Because it's an aircraft with engines and stuff, we don't have to get ourselves on a particularly accurate uh, quote-unquote collision course because we can do some engine burning and stuff. Although we did, a, we did end up getting quite an accurate encounter right out of the bat anyway, so it wasn't too much of a problem. So yeah, just kind of watching that marker there, aiming to be relatively close to the ocean base, just using the last of our descent stage fuel before we can retract all the things that can be destroyed by aerodynamic forces, activate those air breathing engines and of course deploy the lower stage. Now the air breathing engines, for those that are unaware, Lathe has an oxygenated atmosphere which means that air breathing engines work perfectly unlike places like Juna and Eve, which I learned the hard way when I first started out playing this game. Um, so you can use air breathing engines here and obviously Lathe's distance to the sun doesn't make much sense that this atmosphere is the same as Kerbin's. So it is very interesting to, uh, that's kind of one of the main reasons why I wanted to do this series, to explore why Lathe is capable of, you know, being the way it be, <laughs> given its, you know, orbital circumstances. So I set the ocean base as a target just so we could see it on our screen. And then we can just coast our way down. Most of the descent will be done using gliding, but we can do a little bit of engine burning right at the end. Crash, crash tolerance to this thing, because it's such a big and heavy craft, it has to be going quite slowly when it hits the water. So you want to be going, I generally, with all seaplanes that is, I generally aim to be going below 50 meters per second. Of course, at that point, you're very, very likely to start rapidly losing vertical speed. So you want to try and keep your horizontal speed up for as much, like, uh, up as long as you can. And then just before you start approaching kind of splashdown, you then nose up and quickly kill it off all at once. And there is an example there of how that is done. I hope that made sense. If not, just, I don't know, skip back 10 seconds and see what speed I hit the water at. It's a, bit, it's a bit of a knack. Just takes practice, as do most things in this game. One of the things I get asked the most on Discord is how I got, quote unquote, so good at KSP. Um, you may disagree with those people. I'm just quoting what they say. This practice, it's all practice, you know. I probably have more hours than most of the people in your, in, who are watching this video. That's why I'm probably better at the game than most people watching this video. 
Not saying either way before people start accusing me of bragging. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. If you want to get better at KSP, it's practice. And it's the same with anyway, really. I remember building my first SSTO. Uh, Jay-Z's album had just come out. Oh, what's the... It's the one with Justin Timberlake in the first song. And it's called... I can't remember what the album's called. But it's the one that came out like 2014, 2015. Um, I remember sitting down at my desk and thinking, right, I'm going to make an SSTO if it kills me. SSTO at this time was just, you know, uh, from the surface of curb into low curb in orbit. And I probably... And I pressed play on the album and I had iTunes at the time. So iTunes just like... I had it set to just loop albums. I must have listened to that album like four times during the process of me building and failing and building and failing and finally getting into orbit. Because now, whenever I listen to that album, all I can see in my head are the pictures of my terrible first SSTO. In fact, let's put a picture on the screen um, of my first SSTO and see the beauty of that thing. So, you know, I feel like I've come a long way. But that thing took a lot and a lot of hours, like a lot of ridiculous, like a whole day I spent <laughs> developing that SSTO. So if you're watching my videos wondering why your craft suck or whatever, uh, don't be disheartened because um, my I was terrible at this game. I literally was probably worse than most players <laughs> when I started this game. I used to, uh, I was watching like uh, people like Scott Manley and everyone else and thinking like, how on earth am I even getting, I can't even get rockets into orbit. So don't worry, my friend. We've all been there. Just keep practicing and remember to buy my t-shirt. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> but, you know. Uh, this segues me perfectly to talking about um, something I need to talk about today, and that is the fact that there are thousands and thousands and thousands of audiobooks available, guys, at the Pirate Bay. <laughs> I'm not actually sponsored by Audible, don't worry. Um, that was also a joke. Do, do not pirate text books. Anyway, let's get to the actual launch of this craft. There it is. So I have to, you have to use the wet mode of the Panther engine, which I bound to Action Group 2. Takes a little bit of a while to get up, but eventually... After we get to about 70 meters per second, this thing effortlessly pitches up. At which point, you can either leave it in wet mode to get the extra speed, or we can just put it into dry mode to get the extra range. And I think this is kind of the, uh, one of the big failings of this design, of this craft, really. I forgot how far apart the ocean and land bases were. I guess I remembered them being very, very close. Because on the map, I guess they do. But on the scale of the actual size of lathe, they're pretty far apart. So this thing, although it does have enough delta V to get from base to base with a lot left over. It doesn't have enough delta V to kind of do more than one trip on one tank, like it needs to be refueled after each trip, which I now realize may be a problem if we're going to be doing kind of from the land base to the ocean base and then back to the land base. Maybe it has enough fuel to do the round trip, or we may need to stop at one of the islands that like are in between the two. I don't know, actually. Oh, that's tricky. This thing didn't actually land or come to lathe with full fuel because some of the tanks are like the combination of liquid fuel and oxidizer tanks. And I forgot to drain the oxidizer, so I just transferred the contents of those tanks into the lower stage. You may have seen me do that earlier and wondered why I was doing that because you can't dump fuel in this game, unfortunately. So when it's refueled, it will have marginally more delta V than it did earlier on. But oh, yeah, that's a worry, actually. Whoops. <laughs> um, it should be fine. It will probably be fine. Let's not worry about it too much. I mean, at the end of the day, Delta V kind of decreases exponentially because obviously as the fuel burns off, the craft becomes lighter and ultimately has more Delta V. And I guess takeoff will then be easier from the water when we have less fuel. So it's probably fine. Don't worry about it, guys. <laughs> so there's the land base now. So we can get ready to uh, start thinking about deploying our landing gear. Now, it's not in the most ideal location for an aircraft to land. However, you'll be amazed to know that what you're about to see was the first attempt at landing. I guess it's not a surprise because it was a horrific landing. But uh, I, didn't, I didn't have to mess it up and reload it. I did this all in one go. Here we go. And touching down in just a second. Beautiful textbook landing. I really like the uh, effect I got actually from putting the front uh, landing gear inside that cargo bay. I've done that a couple of times with aircraft. And I always like it. I always like the effect you get when you do it. I just always, It's often quite hard to integrate into aircraft design. But because we have the kind of lower mark two fuselages that are there to act as a sort of hull it worked out pretty well on this occasion so now we're all landed we can deploy the solar panels ladders aerials radiators all that and start getting ready to refuel this thing so um yeah it's just a case of toggling the drill and activating this the convertitron and whilst that's um, buzzing away we can get our kerbals onto the surface base so they kind of had variously uh, elegant ways of getting off the craft. This is the entrance to the surface base, by the way. I don't think I really touched on the actual design of it last episode, but here you can see it in a bit more 
in detail now that we're actually here for good. Then we can get the next Kerbal off. As you can see, of course, but it's a good point to mention. There you go. I thought I'd thought I'd use the uh, the parachute rather than you know use the ladder that you decided to use the parachute to get off. Uh, this is a good opportunity to showcase to prove that Lathe has the same oxygen, um, same oxygen, same atmosphere as Kerbin because you can safely remove the helmets of Kerbins without causing them to be killed to death. So it's another proof that there is oxygen in this atmosphere, and another reason, you know, another proof of why this mission is very very necessary. Uh, for the sake of expanding Kerbal knowledge, I suppose. So yeah, I got those two crew cabins there, just in case I forgot to move one Kerbin, uh, one Kerbal out of it and transfer it, which I did in this case. That's why I've got two entrance booths, and then we can get our last Kerbal off, and he's going to use the ladder like a sensible, like the sensible boy he is. <laughs> so we're going to get him running off. But I guess that pretty much inc concludes today's video. The last bit of infrastructure will probably be next week, or if I decide to have a break from Life on Lake, it'll be something else. In fact, I've had a couple of ideas of other missions to do, so maybe I will take a break from Life on Lake next week. We'll have to just, uh, it remains to be seen, really. Uh, but if I do do the next, the next Life on Lake, regardless, will be the way of connecting the land to the, uh, the space station. So it'll be some sort of rapier-based SSTO, I would imagine, but... You know, I might think of something better. I don't know. We'll have to wait and see, won't we? So yeah, we'll just um, refuel this craft here. We can skip ahead and talk about what's on screen in just a second. Uh, in fact, let's just put it on screen now, right? <laughs> uh, two things. Uh, one on the left is the full Life on Lathe playlist. I've now got a playlist for this series. And uh, one on the right was just chosen for you by YouTube's algorithm. There is also a link to my Patreon and to subscribe to my channel. And in the description, there are links to buy my T-shirts and my Discord server and my Instagram and my Twitter and all that good stuff. I hope you enjoyed this video, guys. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your week.